So we are marching on in this uh, sermon series on the Apostles' Creed. And today we're going to be talking about, as Miss Amy said, the Holy Spirit. Now we've come a long way. We've walked through a lot, not all, but a lot of the Apostles' Creed. Uh, first week we started about uh, talking about how faith is important and how, well, we should pass it on from, uh, from one Christian to another and from one generation to another. And, and the recurring theme over and over again, the refrain over and over again for this sermon series is for us as Christians to be known for something rather than against something. Now, sometimes we, we get this bad reputation of being those Christians that are only against all of these things and we don't want anybody to have any fun. Well, yes, there are certain things that we are against, but there are so many things that we are for as well. And, and in the first week, we talked about being for passing on the faith from generation to generation. The second week, we talked about being for a God who creates and creates out of love and to return back to that God of love and talking about first things first, God. Then the last two weeks, we've talked about Jesus being for a God who comes into the flesh and a God who dies for our sins so that we can experience eternal life. Today, we're going to talk about how we are for the Holy Spirit. Now, before we do, I do want to say just one thing, and I didn't say this in the first service, um, but many of you have seen the news of the attacks uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, and even just the increasing attacks on Asian Americans since the coronavirus. Um, we don't stand for that. We don't stand for racism at all because we believe that God created every single human being in his own image. And we celebrate that diversity because it shows us a God who is bigger than we can possibly imagine. And like you, I'm sure, we are tired of hearing about racist killings. We're tired of hearing about racism. But in the same way that I share with you that if there is still one person around our community that doesn't know the love of Jesus Christ, in the same way, if there is one act of racism within our community or within our world, we as a church are responsible to stand up and say that is not the way that God chooses to act in our world. And so this morning, I want to invite you to pray with me, to pray for healing for our nation, but also to pray for us, that we may have the courage to follow God and not be steered in one way or another. So with that said, let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned before you and that we have not always loved our neighbor as ourselves. But by your grace and your mercy, set us free for joyful obedience and set us free to follow you. Lord, today I ask that you would speak through me, with me, and yes, even in spite of me, God. And may your gospel, above all else, be preached. We ask this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. My old car was a 2012 Ford Fusion. I loved that car. And I was privileged enough to have parents who bought me that car as a graduation gift from college. I was lucky, I was blessed, and I, I really loved and enjoyed that car because, well, it was more reliable than the car that I had before that. It got me, the, the Ford Fusion got me from North Carolina back to South Carolina, even to other uh, wild trips that I would take while I was in seminary. It was a good car. But after about 150,000 miles, after it had been attacked by a falling tree branch, after it had been attacked by hail falling from the sky a few years ago here in Greer, South Carolina, and after probably about eight years of me driving it, it was time for a new car. And so I found a new car, but, you know, it was time for me to let go of that car, that 2012 Ford Fusion. And so I decided rather than trading it in that I would go to some used car lot and try to bargain with them to try to get a better deal off of it. So what do I do? As the millennial that I am, well, I go to YouTube to watch a video on how to sell my car better than the car salesman and reading all these articles, et cetera, et cetera. 
And then I drive my car up Wade Hampton Boulevard and find a, a nice used car lot that I figured, you know, I could get a good deal from these people. I pull my car in and I, I, I park it, I turn, turn it off and get out and a salesman comes and meets me and we start talking about the car and talking about the price and talking about its reliability. And I said, listen, this has been a stellar car. Outside of one little incident four years ago, it has been incredibly reliable. And so we're going back and forth, talking about price, talking, you know, doing that whole bargaining, negotiating thing, haggling, all of that. And I said, eventually I got tired of it. I said, listen, this car is reliable. It's great. And anybody would be lucky to have this car. You, here's the keys, get in the car, take it for a test drive, and you'll find out for yourself. So the guy takes the keys and he gets over to the uh, driver's side, opens the door, crawls in, puts it into the ignition, cranks it, click, click, click. And I said, no, 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 that, that, that's a faulty thing. You're not doing it right. So here, do it another way. Click, click, click. In this parking lot, as I'm trying to get the best deal I can out of, let's be honest, my less than stellar car, my car is letting me down because what does it have? A dead battery. I don't know why it decided to get a dead battery of all days that day, but it just simply died. And what do you do when you have a dead battery in your car? You get a jump. You need a jump start. And so, embarrassingly enough, they had to get another car to jump start my car that I tried to sell them. But it was a dead battery. And with the dead battery, it was completely useless. It wouldn't go anywhere. It would hardly even turn on. You know, I see a lot of people that are a lot like my car sometimes, where they have maybe not a dead battery or a dying battery, but a dead or dying soul. You know, in the olden days of Methodism, we used to ask this question of one another, how is it with your soul? We don't ask that question too much anymore. Think about it. When was the last time that somebody asked you, how is it with your soul? If I were to ask you today, how is it with your soul? How would you answer? Would you say that I am on top of the world right now? I, I can't be any better than I am right now. I am so ecstatic. I'm so happy. Nothing can be any better than I am right now. For some of you, that, that may be your answer. And I would say, awesome, great. We are so glad for you. But I suspect many others, if I were to ask you, how is it with your soul? And we had a moment of candid conversations. You would maybe say, Pastor Griff, I'm tired. Or perhaps you'd say, Pastor Griff, I'm just angry all the time. I'm frustrated all the time. Or perhaps some of you would just say, you know what, I, I'm jealous of a lot of people. I'm jealous when I see people and what they have and what they're able to do. All of those are symptoms, I believe, of people that need to be reconnected with the source. People that need a jump start in their lives. Now, we can say that everybody needs a jump start in their lives because we all do. We all uh, run out of energy and we all need to get filled back up again. But I don't think the only problem is, is that we need a jump start. In fact, I think there's another problem. Is that when we know that we need a jump start, that we know we need some more energy, we know we need some more life in us, we go to the wrong source. We go to the news outlets. When we love to watch the news 24-7, when the news hasn't really changed since the morning and it just keeps going over and over and over and over again, the same stories all the time. And as we watch the news, sometimes, we, whether we're aware of it or not, we start to get tensed up and we start getting angry. Perhaps we're angry at the other side. Perhaps we're angry about the situation. Perhaps we're just simply angry. For others, that source is, well, politics. But they love talking about politics. They love talking about political issues. And, and hear me, political issues are important and people need to be talking about them because, well, they come close to home oftentimes. But if our source is politics, well, we too, well, we're going to be angry or tired or divisive or attacking others. 
So sometimes we get our source, we, we get our jump starts from the news, politics, and for others it's social media. Whether it's Facebook, whether it's YouTube, whether it's Twitter or TikTok or any of all these other things out there, we get plugged into those sources and sometimes what happens is, yeah, they, they make us angry too, but we also see how successful some of these people are, how much fun some of these people are. And we start to get a little envious of others. And we start to maybe not hate them, but resent some of these people. See, the problem isn't just that we need a, a source, we need a jump start. It's we need an entirely new source. So where do we get that? Where do we get that jump start in our lives? Well, for us as Christians, the answer is the Holy Spirit. Already this morning you heard Cheryl reading a little bit about, uh, about the Holy Spirit, reading a little bit about uh, what the Holy Spirit was up to, but now I want to read what Jesus says about the Holy Spirit. Uh, to dive a little bit deeper into what Jesus is saying and telling his disciples and sharing with them well, what the purpose is of the Holy Spirit. So this morning I'm going to be reading from John chapter 14, uh, verses 15 through 19, and then we're going to jump down to 25 through 27. And again, all of these words, this is Jesus talking. And this is in the middle of a chapter where Jesus is doing a lot of talking. So we're, we're lifting this out of a conversation, a wider conversation. And this is what Jesus has to say. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. And now jump down to verse 25 where it says, I have said these things to you while I am still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything. And remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not let them be afraid. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let them be afraid. Peace I give you. These are all the things that we want. So how do we get it? How do we get to that place? Well, the answer is the Holy Spirit. And so this is what I want you to remember for today and into this week. The Holy Spirit jumpstarts our faith. The Holy Spirit jumpstarts our faith. In this passage, in this long passage, Jesus is preparing his disciples for what comes next. And it's unbelievable. And many of us know the story behind all of this. But in the coming chapters, in a few chapters from now, Jesus is going to go to, to Gethsemane. He's going to pray in Gethsemane. He's then going to talk. He's then going to be arrested. He's going to be tried. He's going to be crucified. And he's going to die. And of course, he's going to be resurrected as well. We know that end of the story. We know it from this perspective that Jesus is raised from the dead. The disciples didn't quite know that. But here Jesus is preparing them for all of these things and for what comes next after the resurrection. And here's what the unbelievable thing is. Is that after Jesus is raised from the dead, he is going to leave his disciples on their own. Jesus is going to leave them. He's not going to stick around. And not only is Jesus going to leave them, but he's also going to give them a job to do. He gives them a job to be the continuation of his own ministry into the world. So they're going to be witnesses of the story that they have seen unfold before their very eyes. That God would come into the flesh in order to save the world and to give it new life. They're going to be the continuation of Jesus Christ preaching about the good news of God's kingdom coming close to every single person. They're going to be the continuation of Jesus' ministry to heal the sick to care for the poor, and to make sure that the outsiders are treated like insiders and that all people are welcome into the kingdom. Jesus is giving them all of these instructions and giving them all of this task to do, 
and Jesus is going to leave them to do it. Oftentimes I hear Jesus called the great delegator. And so Jesus is telling his disciples for all that is coming next and all of this hard work, and, and let's be honest, it's hard work. And in some ways, it's impossible work. But even more so, what Jesus tells them, the result of that will be. Because at times, when they follow Jesus, they're going to be resisted. That at times, when they follow Jesus, they're going to be hated. That at times, when they follow Jesus, they will be persecuted and called names and and thrown out of places where they once belonged. But above all else, what Jesus tells them, that some of you, if not all of his apostles, by following me and believing in my name, you will be killed. Jesus is giving the apostles and the disciples hard work, difficult work, and quite frankly, impossible work. But Jesus is sending help. Jesus says in this passage that he's going to send the Holy Spirit, the advocate, for these disciples. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is power. The Holy Spirit is meant to jumpstart their faith, their witness, their journey into the world, so that they can see what God is going to do through them. That the Holy Spirit will jumpstart their faith, even in those moments where they realize that Jesus is no longer with them. The Holy Spirit will give them power, the energy to move forward into the world to accomplish God's to accomplish God's goals in the here and now. But how? How is this even remotely possible? After all, these disciples, well, they're fishermen. They're, they're uneducated kind of people. They, they don't know what they're doing. They don't know. They've gotten the answer wrong more times than they've gotten it right. Jesus says that it's going to be up to the Spirit. But how, how is it going to jumpstart their faith? Well, Jesus talks about within this passage that, well, the Holy Spirit will be with you. And he will be your advocate. And, and the kind of idea that we get behind that is, well, you'll have comfort You'll have peace. You'll have joy. Okay, but that doesn't necessarily talk about empowering necessarily. Well, Jesus goes on to maybe talk a little bit more about how the the Holy Spirit will remind you of everything that I I have done. And it will teach you all the things that will need to be done in the future. Well, that's great. But that's not necessarily empowering. Maybe a little bit, but it's not the power that we are kind of talking about. Jesus, though, does say one thing that is interesting. He says to his disciples who are around him at this table, he says, because I live, you also will live. Jesus is talking not just about his resurrection, but he is talking about the Holy Spirit coming to live with all of them. Because another scripture elsewhere says it this way, that the Holy Spirit, the Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, now lives in you. The Spirit that can bring dead things back to life is available to the disciples and is available to you. There's the power. There's that jump start that we're looking for. Because the power that the Holy Spirit offers, well, shows us that the Holy Spirit is thrilled to use this ragtag group of disciples to utterly change the world completely. It's what we see starting in that Acts reading that we had earlier today. That the, the, the disciples are gathered together in the upper room together, and, and they are together, and then the Holy Spirit comes as a whisper. No. The Holy Spirit comes as a rushing, violent wind, and upon every single one of them, tongues as a fire rest upon them. And what happens after that? These ragtag Galileans, these ragtag fishermen, are all of a sudden empowered to speak in other languages. 
to speak in other known languages all around them so that people can understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. What we see in that story is that a fisherman by the name of Peter, who was too afraid to claim that he was, he was a follower of Jesus Christ days earlier, is now standing before thousands of people and telling them the gospel story and saying, repent and be baptized. This is what it looks like for the Holy Spirit to jumpstart our faith. Now, two things. The promise of the Holy Spirit is available and offered to you as well. But also recognize this, is that the commandment and the responsibility that Jesus gives his disciples is also extended to you. Jesus expects every single one of us in this room to be a part of his mission, to be a part of God's mission into the world, to make disciples and to make a difference. But we can't do it without the Spirit. So, perhaps you're like one of those people that I described earlier. That you're tired. You're angry. You're just ready to give up. You don't know how much longer you can continue to push forward. But the good news is that the Holy Spirit can jumpstart your faith. If you're tired of seeing all the stuff that is going on in the world, and it makes you angry, it makes you envious, it, it makes you have all of these emotions, if you're, if you're one of these people that is connected to the, the, these different sources, today is an opportunity to switch that source to something far more holy and far more powerful. The Holy Spirit jumpstarts your faith, jumpstarts your purpose, and jumpstarts your life in a new and entirely different direction than you can possibly imagine. And God will take care of the rest. Many years ago, there was a man by the name of Evan Roberts. And by many years ago, I mean early 1900s. So this is uh, for some of us, ancient history, but in the early 1900s, uh, Evan Roberts was working in the coal mines in Wales. And back in those days, well, you started working in the coal mines at a very, very young age. And he worked in the coal mines from 13 to 23. He was in the coal mines for a decade, if not more. And Evan Roberts, well, he didn't come from a family of wealth. He didn't come from a family of significance. He didn't even have really that great of an education. It's why he was in the coal mines. But as he was working in the coal mines, he sensed God calling him to something more. Calling him to pursue ministry. And so at the age of 26, Evan Roberts decided that it was time for him to attend seminary. Uh, and and, and on, on his path to be a Methodist and eventually a Presbyterian minister, he, he went to seminary. But in the first couple of weeks, there were revivals that were starting to pop up around the Welsh countryside. And he asked permission from the president to go to some of these week-long uh, revivals. And he went to one, and, well, his spirit was lifted. His spirit was empowered. And in many ways, he saw a vision of what God was calling him to do. And only the way that the Holy Spirit can do in unexplainable ways, Evan Roberts received a vision from God that God was calling him to do, have revivals. And through those revivals, hundreds of thousands, a hundred thousand people would be saved. And so he went back to seminary and he, he told a few people about this vision. Then eventually he asked permission to go and put a stall on his seminary education and to host his own revivals. And he started, I believe, in 1904 to 1905 to host these revivals. And within two years, 100,000 souls were saved by God's grace. 100,000 people converted to Christianity, became followers of Jesus Christ. And many years later, as one article says, 
thousands of those men died in a war called war, World War I. The Holy Spirit is thrilled to use ragtag groups of people to do amazing and extraordinary things. Even somebody from coal, a coal miner to see hundreds of thousands of people saved. For us, it's about surrender. It's about being open to what the Holy Spirit is doing in our lives. And it's being open to ask the Holy Spirit into our lives. So today, I want to invite you to do something that may be a little bit out of your comfort zone. That it may be a little bit different. It may be something that you're perhaps not even familiar with. But today, I want to invite you to pray to receive the Holy Spirit to pray to receive the Holy Spirit to come into your life. For some of you, you may have at your baptism had the pastor say to you, may the Holy Spirit work within you. At confirmation, you may have had somebody say, may the Holy Spirit work within you. But today, I want to invite you to say that prayer, to invite the Holy Spirit to come into your life and to see what God will do, how the Holy Spirit will jumpstart your faith, your life, and your purpose. Now, for some, this is odd. This is strange. I didn't grow up in a tradition where we talked a lot about the Holy Spirit. But for us, to see revival, to see people have changed minds and changed hearts, to see people become disciples of Jesus Christ, and to see our church make a difference here, we can't do it on our own. But we need the Holy Spirit. So I invite you to join me in this prayer that will be up on the screen. I, I, I borrowed this prayer from a book called Creed, What Christians Believe and Why. Um, it's one of those books that I've been reading throughout this sermon series to help me and for Wednesday night Bible study. And this prayer is at the end of his Holy Spirit chapter, and he invites his readers to read this along with him. And so today, I invite you to read this with me, to pray that the Holy Spirit will come into your life so that it may jumpstart your faith. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, I need you. Breath of God, fill me wholly and completely. Form and shape me into the person you want me to be. Lead me to do what you want me to do. Empower me and use me. Speak to me and through me. Produce your fruit in me. Help me to listen to your voice above all other voices that clamor for my attention. Come, Holy Spirit. I need you. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Mm -hmm.